Well, hello, everyone. It is so good to be back here at SAGU. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Uglo and Dr. McElhaney for inviting me to come and speak at this conference. And also a big thank you to SAGU for putting on the archaeology seminars that's been going on for many years. Um, also, big shout out to um, my um, alma mater, being Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and the Tandy Institute, my professors there, um, for their encouragement and, and um, challenging me in my um, research. Um, so just like Dr. Um, Yugla was just saying, I sat in your seat um, several years ago uh, at an archaeology seminar, and this is where I got my interest in archaeology, as he is saying. Um, Eric Welch was here and did a presentation on Gath and the Philistines, Goliath's hometown in Israel, and I was just like so interested in that. So I went up to him afterwards and was just, how can I get involved? How can I go to Israel? How can I ex excavate? And so he invited me to come, and I spent the next two summers in Israel excavating there um, at Telesophy Gath, and I was just immersed into the world of archaeology. And um, now it looks like I'm going to be studying archaeology for the rest of my life. So here we are. <laughs> I love it. It's a passion. Um, if any of you are interested in getting involved, any types of excavations or looking to go overseas to Israel, please come up and talk to me. Um, I can definitely get you guys hooked up with that. Um, so like um, Dr. There's the thank you. <laughs> um, like Dr. Yugla was saying, um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about women in the um, Greco-Roman world, looking more so from the second century BCE, at the end of the second temple period, through the first century CEE, so um, 100 years before Christ, 100 years after Christ. Um, but before we get into that, looking at the details of that, um, let's get into some specifics about women's studies in general um, with regards to archaeology. Um, with that, it came to the attention of scholars in the 80s that women weren't as talked about in uh, as much in historical and archaeological studies as as men were, as other um, specialties were paid attention to, they noticed women weren't really there. Where are the women? Um, <clears throat> women were largely overlooked. Uh, general history books um, that had lots of chapters dedicated to archaeological studies, historical accounts, um, gave one chapter that they touched on a section of women that also included children and slavery. So they noticed that this was a problem, right? Um, so from this immersed what is now called gender archaeology. Gender archaeology seeks um, to point out and correct uh, a male bias that was occurring in archaeology. <clears throat> it really seeks to change from the androcentric assumptions, meaning male-centered assumptions, that males were at the center of society and that women were just on the sidelines, marginalized, that they were basically non-existent. Gender archaeology points that out and says, ah, is that true? Let's challenge it. Um, gender archaeology also seeks to critique the existing structures of archaeological practice, meaning that at, up until this point, and even still now, archaeology as a discipline is largely male-centered. So from the very beginning when archaeology um, started out at the turn of um, the 20th century in the early 1900s, it's men that are going over, men that are interpreting the data of what's being excavated, um, uh, and their interpretation is what's being had. And so we notice uh, well, men and women largely think differently. Why don't we have any females that are here that are interpreting the data? Why is it largely um, males that are being involved in this field? And then also gender archaeology recognizes that gender roles, meaning women's roles, aren't the same across every society uh, and every time period. Gender roles uh, can differ within a society from household to household and change based on the choices of an individual. Gender roles are also different between social classes. So it's important to remember that you can look at elite women in the Roman world and a lower, a lower class woman um, 
but they're going to have different gender and social roles. It's not going to be the same rules that apply across the board here. Um, so we can't say that women in the Hellenistic classical Greece were viewed and had the same gender roles as Roman women or Jewish women or women in the Christian time period. Um, they're all very different cultures, different contexts, different time periods. And gender archeology span seeks to bring this to the forefront of our mind when we're looking at the data and trying to interpret it. So with all of this understanding, these new approaches that we're developing and bringing to the forefront of scholars' minds, we have all of these um, new specific um, research studies that were oriented towards ancient women, looking at their daily lives, their roles in society, what were they involved in, what were they not. Um, and so we have books coming out like Discovering Eve, looking at women in the ancient Israelite context, and then later Rediscovering Eve. Eve, where she corrects some of her interpretations. Um, and then also another book, these are just some of my favorites, um, Women in Late Antiquity, which is more of the world that I play in, um, diving into women in Christian settings, um, looking at the early church in like the fifth, fourth, fifth century CE, um, and also women in the pagan settings that were still around. So you have all of these gender-specific um, studies that are popping up now in research. And believe it or not, we're all aware women in history, women in society, acknowledging women is a very popular topic nowadays. Um, so it just proves into a lot of research that's going on. So how does gender archaeology and the Bible go together? What does it matter looking at gender archaeology with studying the Bible? Well, it helps us become aware that our interpretation of the ancient world is full of biases. Whether we admit it or not, we all approach scripture with a certain um, view, a certain agenda, um, a certain worldview. And gender archaeology just points that out and says, hey, you're approaching scripture with this or historical context or archaeological context, not just scripture. But it just points out that we have a bias. Um, whether that's thinking your bias could go on either side of the spectrum or anywhere in between, whether that's thinking women didn't have a place in ancient society, that they were always in the home, that they really not, were, uh, weren't existent mo most in the public settings, um, or on the other side of the spectrum, you can try to argue with your bias that um, men and women of the ancient world were of equal standing, that women in the ancient world were social climbers, individualistic, and um, had equal grounds with men. Um, um, whichever spectrum you fall on, these are all biases, and um, your a social agenda plays into how you interpret the scripture. So these are part of our Western notions, modern concepts, and even political agendas that we take and place into ancient historical context. So we have to seek to interpret history and societies without these biases and without these modern lenses so we can really step into the ancient Near Eastern world, the classical antiquity world, the Greco-Roman world to attempt to understand history for what it is. Um, and so as SAGU uh, students here, we all are familiar with the term um, exegesis versus eisegesis. Well, this definitely applies here. Um, exegesis meaning taking in the context, reading scripture, um, taking it for what it is, looking at the context. Eisegesis meaning reading um, into scripture what you want it to be with your personal bias. Our goal here is exegesis not eisegesis, as we'll all learn in our Bible study and hermeneutical classes. So with all of that being said, um, with an understanding, a background of gender archaeology and how um, that can better help us to interpret um, women's studies, let's get into the first century Greco roman world. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be looking at the social standing of women. So how are they perceived socially? Not, no, not necessarily within the home front, but in the public sphere, so within society. Um, and we're going to be mainly focusing between the 2nd century BCE to the 1st century BCE, as I said earlier. We're going to be looking at their social standing by first analyzing social perspective. Um, that women had 
um, by men during this period. So we're going to be examining a lot of literature. Well, who's writing the literature? Men. So what is their social perception of women during this time? We're also going to look at some public occupations um, that women held at this time, looking at their participation in society. What can we say of that? And then um, lastly, we'll just quickly look at um, an example of legal and contractual activity. Were women involved in financial and legal matters? <clears throat> so how were women perceived by men in the Greco-Roman world? What were men saying about these women? It's important to remember that the men writing in these ancient times during this period also had biases and agendas, but let's see with, we, with us recognizing that if we can still take anything from it and apply it. So first, we have um, Shalom Zion, Salome Alexandra. She is a Hasmonean queen. Um, she inherited the throne from her husband, Alexander Janaeus. She ruled for nine peaceful years from 76 to 67 BCE. It's important to know uh, about her specific situation that her husband, the former king, Alexander Janaeus, bequeathed his throne to her rather than his two adult sons, John Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II. What? He had two adult sons, and he said, mm, I'm going to give the throne to her. That speaks so much of his perception of his wife at this time, which makes me think, from my personal bias of women probably weren't that important, uh, he's thinking something different here. Um, for him to pass up his two sons and give the role to a woman, um, with, though it's not outlandish to do so, speaks volumes of this. We also see her coming up in some early Pharisaic rabbinic writings um, that portray her in a positive light, that validate, support her reign. Um, and was there a political agenda in these Pharisaic writings? You betcha. Um, she is one that reinstated the Pharisees to the rule. So this is within the Hasmonean dynasty, Hasmonean rulers happening. Rulers previous to her um, kicked the Pharisees out and said, we're going to give the, the authorities to some Sadducees for the time being. And they weren't happy with it. But she comes in reinstatement and reinstates them to their power. And so they're in full support of her. But what's important is that they mention her and that her rule is still validated with them mentioning her. We also have Josephus writing about her um, in two places, in his Antiquities of the Jews and in his The Jewish War. Um, in the war, he paints her in a positive light and describes her as a devout and strong ruler. Uh, however, in antiquity, he paints her as a... Um, a usurper, uh, a bastard of the throne, somebody not, not um, worthy of the throne. Um, and so we have these two different perceptions going on that's very clear of what Josephus does. But we have to remember the context of his writing. So the Jewish war was written earlier than antiquities in a Jewish context, right? So he's writing about a Jewish Hasmonean queen in a Jewish context, so he praises her. But later in, um, in antiquities, he's in a Roman setting, and he's got Roman influence, Roman mentors that don't think of the Jews in the same way, and so he cuts her down, right? So the point here is not that she was praised in a highlight and then in a negative light. It's that she was mentioned at all and that her reign was validated, um, and that it was accounted for in history. That is big. And it just says a lot of what um, the social standing of women at the time. Next, let's look at um, the story of Judith. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have heard about the book of Judith, but this is a book that's part of the Apocrypha, um, and it is set in a time of writing um, about the Assyrian siege into the land of Israel and into Jerusalem. Now, it's not, it wasn't written then. It's written in a second century context, so it still takes from what they're thinking of women in the second century, but plays it back into a story that's happening in the Assyrian period. Um, so this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, it's so cool. Um, we have this woman 
Judith, who is a part of the city, a little village outside of Jerusalem. It's one of the last strongholds until you get to Jerusalem. So you have the Assyrian army is camped out in front of this city. They've cut off their water supply, and they've been sieging there for 34 days, and they're just waiting them out, starving them out. They're all going to die off. The elders of the city are freaking out. They don't know what to do. They've got this big Assyrian army here. We're a little village. We're the last resort before they hit Jerusalem. What are we going to do? So she hears this, invites them, the elders, into her home and just says, listen, guys, I got this. Just let me take care of it. I got it. Um, And to paint the context more so, Judith is a a pious widow, very devout. She's painted as a very devout and faithful woman. She's not married, um, but she is known for her beauty. Um, So she just says, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I got this. She leaves the city, walks right into the Assyrian camp, goes straight to the general's tent and spends the evening with him. And um, she basically, she seduces the general, uh, Holofernes is his name, the Assyrian general. And in a vulnerable moment, uh, she cuts off his head. (laughs) Pretty cool. (laughs) So in this, the story just highlights that a woman did what men could not do. She walked into the camp surrounded by his men. She walked into his tent, killed him with his sword. What? What? She just defeated the whole Assyrian army doing that? Um, She used seduction, okay, as a weapon here, Um, not necessarily in a physical fight, which she does use a weapon uh, as a sword to cut off his head. But her main point is to go in and um, get him in a vulnerable vulnerable moment, get him um, drinking a little bit, you know, they're going to go into the night, and she takes that moment and, um, and kills him. And in the story, using the seduction, using her, you know, it describes her getting um, all dolled up, basically, putting on her best jewels, getting her best dress on. Um, she's going in there for a purpose, and she knows what she's doing. But the story, uh, the writer doesn't admonish her or shame her for doing so couple verses down from it, it actually says that she's the glory of Jerusalem, the great pride of our nation, and you've done this all on the merit of your own hand. They recognize that she did what men could not do. So this is a very unique story where we have a woman who's kind of in a social setting that would be looked down upon. You, you use your seduction against a man, like that's, that's shameful. But they praise her for it, um, specifically because it puts off the Assyrian army. But the, still the fact that she has such a, a high role and a protagonist role that's being played here in a secondary or second century context is, is pretty significant. Um, by the way, all of these mosaics, they are modern mosaics done by the um, artist Lillian Broca. She had them displayed at the a Bible Museum here in Dallas just two years ago. Uh, it's pretty cool. Mosaics is kind of my thing, so I thought I'd put them in for you guys. Um, another example of what we see women's perception um, in literature is found in the book of Second Maccabees. Um, so again, this is Jewish writing happening in the second, um, late second, early first century. Um, and here we have another female character that's portrayed in a positive light. Uh, So this story is particularly about a woman and her seven sons. Um, The Jews are being um, heavily, heavily, heavily persecuted persecuted by the Seleucid rulers at this time. Um, They are mistreating Jews. They are throwing off their religion. They are telling them you need to eat this this unclean food, and if you don't, we'll kill you. They're they're facing heavy, heavy persecution at this moment. Um, And so this story paints a very, very gruesome tale about the faithfulness of the Jews at this time. And so what happened uh, is that the the Seleucid army comes in and gets this family, a woman and her seven sons, brings them out into the courtyard and are just brutally persecuting them, saying, like, you need to eat this food. If you don't, we'll kill you. And one by one, the story goes and shows her sons stepping up and saying, 
I don't care what you do to me. I'm going to die honorable to, um, to our Lord, to God. I will not abandon my Jewish faith. And so it paints a very, very gruesome picture of them dying for their faith. It describes... Um, One of the sons says, I will not use my hands to eat this unclean food. And then you see a soldier come up, and he chops off his hands and his feet and hands it to the mother. And he's like, well, he won't eat it, so there you go. Um, And then it also describes them, like, taking off, skinning off their scalps and forcing them to eat that instead. It is a very, very gruesome story. Um, And the author flips to the... um, the point of view of the of the woman, the mom, several times in the accounts as one by one her seven sons are being killed in front of her. And the author paints her her perspective is encouraging her sons the entire time to stay faithful to the Lord, um, to keep up, to remember that we will be together right short, shortly after this, that no matter what persecution we face, um, stay strong to your faith. And so it's this not, she's not cowering in fear. She's not saying, do whatever you need to get out of this situation. She is encouraging them to stand strong, which is um, so cool that she has that authoritative voice in this story to encourage her son. And the author several times goes back and highlights that. Um, and so that's just a really cool representation of women um, happening by a second century author.